Good afternoon, everybody. This is Ben Powers coming at you from the Commander's Voice. My guest today is Al Ovius. He is the author of the book, The Boy Generals, which is a discussion of Civil War Calvary through the lives of George Custer and Wesley Merritt. So Al, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me, Ben. So I'm really excited to have you on. You and I were talking a little bit about how, uh, before we hit record, about the book about the Civil War. So I'm really interested in hearing about how this became a subject that interested you uh, enough to write a book? Uh, basically, you know, I mentioned the fact that my real name is kind of hard to pronounce and it's because I was born in Cuba and I came over in 1960. My grandmother was married to an American. So when we came over in 1960, we moved to Connecticut. So in essence, I became a Connecticut Yankee. <laughs> and. Uh, a few years later, my father took me to my first trip to Gettysburg, and I just fell in love with the place, and it really sparked things from then on. And as you can see behind me, I've been reading Civil War since I, I mean, going on 50 years now, and uh, love every minute of it. Um, I uh, became uh, George Custer, a aficionado, I guess you would say. Like many people, when you read them in Facebook, they always say, well, what was the thing that turned you on to George Custer? Well, obviously, they died with their boots on with, you know, Earl Flynn, <laughs> even though the movie was historically inaccurate. Flynn played the part of Custer almost to perfection. Um, then there was that movie Tonka. That was uh, a Disney movie in which Tonka becomes the horse that we eventually come to know as Comanche, that was the only wounded animal left on the battlefield at the end of the Little Bighorn. And finally, I read uh, uh, Quentin Reynolds' Custer's Last Stand, which is part of a children's series of history books for, land, for the landmark books. So those three combined started me. And then when I really started getting serious about the subject, I read uh, Custer Victorious by Professor Gregory Irwin and um, Custer, The Life of General Armstrong Custer by uh, Jay Monahan. And those two were the things that really got me going. And then after that, it was just nonstop. Oh, fantastic. And that, that actually sets up my next question perfectly, because you had indicated that you're, you're a Custer aficionado, but you had wanted to write, but you didn't want to write a dry history. You were looking for a character study. And it's almost like you were looking for something to juxtapose against Custer's character. So could you t introduce the world to uh, Wesley Merritt for us? Uh, obviously, the world needs to be introduced to Wesley Merritt, considering that he had one of the most illustrious military careers. He is easily one of the most unknown generals of the Civil War. Uh, his career, I mean, he died in 1906. By that time, he had fought the Confederates. He had fought the Indians. He was uh, in charge of the uh, Spanish expedition to the, I mean, the American expedition to the Philippines during the Spanish-American War. He wrote extensively after the war. He was the founding president of a group called the uh, U.S. Cavalry Association, and he was one of the main writers for the Journal of the U.S. Cavalry Association called the Juska. And in it, he laid out his vision of an army that would eventually move from being just an Indian fighting army to an army that was capable of taking on the powers, the very powerful armies of the European powers. So he had an illustrious career, and the fact that he is so unknown is just, it's mind-boggling, actually. So in, like you say, I found the perfect person to juxtapose against Custer. They were totally different in personality, character, 
uh, you know, demeanor, whatever word you want to use, they were the complete opposite. Um, they were more important. They were totally different in their tactical philosophies. Uh, if you go back to the European model of cavalry in action, you have the hussars, which were lightly armed with saber, maybe even a revolver, and were used for scouting, reconnoitering, things of that sort, and of course, delivering a mounted saber charge when it was required. Merritt, on the other hand, uh, when he graduated from West Point, went out west and became part of the second U.S. Dragoons. And as a dragoon, uh, they, they were trained to fight dismounted when it was necessary with carbines. So you have these two opposing philosophies. I, I like to refer to it as the fight for the soul of the cavalry because they, I mean, they started button heads almost from the beginning, although it was not too bad at the beginning and then just escalated, escalated, and escalated. And so finally Custer towards the end of the war was just downright insubordinate to, to merit. Yes, sir. And I, I get the impression through reading the book that part of the challenge for Custer, bearing in mind a man has a personality and you have to be true to your character. Part of his problem was he graduates from West Point and very soon after that, he finds himself into combat and he has a very meteoric rise. Whereas while you said Merritt's career kind of mirrored Custer's in terms that he had a very rapid rise as well, but he had that pre-war seasoning with the second dragoons. He, he became a quiet professional before the war even started. Whereas Custer rolls in day one of the war and he's, he's not much more than a boy with only his West Point experience. And he doesn't have any real, true professional leavening. Is, is that an accurate interpretation? I wouldn't go that far. You know, a lot of people do say that uh, Merrick had that experience of uh, down on the unit level. Uh, company. He was part of uh, John Buford's company in, in the Second Dragoons. Custer uh, really didn't get much. He was actually a member of the 5th U.S. Cavalry, which was a regular regiment. And there were, at the very beginning, a few actions where he actually did command small unit tactics, but not on the level that uh, Merritt did out west. So it's like saying, in many ways, Merritt is associated as being regular army, whereas Custer got his commission in the volunteers, and many people look at him as being a member of the volunteer that joined during the Civil War. And that's not true because Custer was a ring-wearing member of the uh, West Point Academy. Yes, sir. So, you know, the fact that he's kind of besmirched in the sense that he didn't have the experience that Merritt had was something that galled him continuously and escalated as the war went on. And, you know, he felt that he was not just as good as Merritt, but he felt he was better than Merritt. Unfortunately, Merritt had the reputation among the higher ups of the army that he was this calm, steady, stoic professional. Whereas Custer had the reputation early on of being rash, reckless, and many of the things that he did kind of helped to establish his reputation. Early in his career, when he was a staff officer, he was, um, you know, even though he was a tough soldier, he was also uh, a very heavy drinker, a uh, heavy cursor. He served under Phil Kearney, who was renowned for his ability to curse like no one else in the US Army. And, Custer really looked up to Kearney. Uh, so then he gets associated with Kilpatrick in his third cavalry division. And Kilpatrick, of course, definitely had the reputation of being impetuous, rash, reckless. And Custer did not go out of his way to disassociate himself from that, you know, that kind of thing. So in a way, Custer did kind of make his own bed and he would spend obviously my book is an attempt to really bring out 
the true nature of the soldier that he was, of the great cavalryman that he was during the war, and try and answer some of these charges that he was reckless and rash and flamboyant and all of these things, and Merritt wasn't. Now, the one thing that comes out in your writing, too, and it, it's really fascinating, is the fact that, that that reckless and rash reputation in the 20th and 21st century is always has to be looked at in light of what happened at Little Bighorn, whereas in actuality, as you say, despite being aggressive and maybe a little too aggressive, Custer was a very successful officer in the Civil War. The, the, that mindset and that, that character trait held him in very good stead when he was a commanding officer in the cavalry in the Civil War, true? True. And the irony of the whole thing for me is, is that I spent many, many, many years studying the Little Bighorn as opposed to Custer in the Civil War. But there came a point where here I am living in Miami and the Little Bighorn is way up there in Montana. And it's not like I can go to the battlefield every week and walk the grounds or ride the grounds or whatever. And I came to the realization that, you know, there's dozens of books published about Custer and the Little Bighorn every year. And that there are these guys who have just spent their lives walking that battlefield, know it intimately, and have studied the Indian side and the Custer side. And it was just impossible for me to compete on that kind of a level. And that's why I ended up focusing on the Civil War side of Custer's career. Yes, sir. And the outgrowth of that juxtaposing him with Merritt. Uh, I'm interested in Merritt's character, but also his early training. Do you believe, and I'm in no way trying to put words in your mouth, but in addition to being kind of a stoic, quiet officer with that pre-war professional training, do you think the, the men that he came up under imbued him with that mounted rifleman dragoon mentality like working for john buford for example i i see a lot of buford in merit when i read your book well without a doubt john buford was one of uh merit's mentors when the confederates finally fired on fort sumter and the second dragoons got the order to come east to fight in the eastern war it took them months to get from utah where the second dragoons were stationed, all the way to the coast where Washington, D.C., and you know, all these battles were going to be fought. And in reality, Merritt had two mentors because commanding the second dragoons was a guy by the name of Philip St. George Cook, who ended up writing a, a manual on cavalry tactics. And the weird thing is, is that even though he was in command of a unit that had been trained to fight dismounted with carbines, he himself was a huge proponent of delivering a forceful, powerful cavalry charge at the moment where it needed to be done. Buford, as we know, had that truculent stand against uh, the Confederates at Gettysburg, which was a totally dismounted action, and Merritt picked up on that. But he had already gravitated in the direction of dismounted action during the campaign that preceded Gettysburg, which was Aldi, Middleburg, Upperville. And when you come out of the Bull Run Mountains there, there, it splits. There's two roads that split. One goes north and one goes south. And Custer went south, Merritt goes north. And the ground to the south was a lot more open. And Custer ends up participating in a famous charge in which uh, with Kilpatrick and uh, another guy and Kilpatrick's horse gets killed. The other guy gets killed. And all of a sudden Custer's out in front of this regiment all by himself in a mounted charge. Whereas Merritt goes north and they approach coming down this way. And the whole area is broken up by fences and stone walls and things like that. And it really dictated against the use of the horse as a, an in, a mounted instrument. And he ended up becoming reliant on the carbine. 
that's that's almost a uh, fate, if if you will, that they went on the routes that played to their strengths and their mindset. It was, and uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of things about that campaign that are interesting, aside from the fact that at the very end of the campaign, they both became brigadier generals. But there was one action where uh, Custer ended up uh, watching as uh, uh, the cavalry made a flank attack on the rebels while Strong Vincent's brigade of uh, infantry struck them from the front. And he was able to see this interaction of infantry holding down the front while the cavalry outflanked the enemy. And this would become a trademark of Custer's from then on. And one of the main reasons for that was that of all the, the only two units in the Army of the Potomac Cavalry Corps that were armed with the Spencer repeating rifle were the 5th and the 6th Michigan, which became part of Custer's brigade. And he tried to combine what he had seen during the Aldi Middleburg Upperville campaign and try to create a complete soldier that was able to fight dismounted or deliver a cavalry charge when it was needed. Merritt, on the other hand, he paid lip service to the use of the saber, but a lot of the times his men had their sabers strapped to their saddles. And uh, as the Confederates tended more and more to fight dismounted because they were unable to meet the Union cavalry in a saber melee, then Merritt became more and more uh, involved with uh, dismounted tactics. And another thing about Merritt was that he was a stickler for detail. And one of the things that he had been taught by both St. George Cook and Buford was the care of the horses. And later on, when he wrote articles for um, the Juska for the Journal of the U.S. Cavalry, he put, put it all down on paper. It was called Marching Cavalry. And it is, a, I mean, it is minute in detail when to take a break, when to water the horses, when to do this, when to do that. In the end, it almost became kind of like more the end than the means of what the horse was supposed to be. Whereas Guster coming up with Kilpatrick, well, Kilpatrick would ride a horse into the ground if he could just get him an inch closer to the enemy. And he did so on several occasions. So, you know, it's, it starts, it, at Gettysburg, they weren't really two opposites. Custer had a spectacular Gettysburg. I mean, the third day he's battled on East Cavalry Field where he launched himself at uh, Jeb Stewart's Cavalry and sent them reeling. Well, he wasn't alone sending them reeling, but he was the one that charged straight into the middle of it, whereas Merritt really didn't have, I, I say that Merritt had a mediocre uh, campaign. He let his uh, brigade become diluted with side actions like uh, uh, chasing the rebel wagons up to Fairfield where the 6th U.S. Cavalry was decimated by Grumble Jones's brigade and uh, other things like that. Then when he was called to South Cavalry Field, I have a letter from a guy that says, well, we kind of spent the afternoon sitting by a little stream, you know, and he doesn't get there until about three o'clock in the afternoon with a force that's already been pretty hard hit. And as he tries to get around in the rear of the Confederate right flank, he just doesn't have enough men because Laws, who was in charge of the um, division at that time, Hood's division, just kept stretching his line out and out and out and out. And Merritt was just never able to get around him. Interesting. So do you think the success at Gettysburg for Custer cemented his reputation? And that might be the point where he maybe started to eclipse Merritt a little bit, at least in popular opinion? It 
I'm not going to say that it cemented his reputation, but I will definitely say that it brought Custer to the attention of the national press and to the national reading public. So in that sense, yes. Um, nothing, Marin unfortunately was old school and old school demanded that you don't allow newspaper men into your camps. Well, here we have, uh, how can I put this? We have a new breed of newspaper men, of reporters, of correspondents. They grew up in the age of the railroad, the telegraph. You know, you write a, a news article about a battle, you get it sent by telegraph, and within a day or two, it's published in a newspaper. Custer, because of his outgoing personality, uh, welcomed these reporters into his camp, and they wrote extensively about him. And for that reason, it didn't cement his reputation, but it certainly started bringing the attention of the reading public onto his actions. Understood, sir. So what would you say, and this is, I'm just asking personal opinion now, what do you, what do you think uh, Merritt's best campaign was or his best day in the Civil War was? What was his Gettysburg? That's a tough one. Uh, you know, like I say, the fact that his actions were not made known to the American reading public really makes it hard to determine what he was. He was in command at Winchester. He was in command at Yellow Tavern. Um, but yet, who gets the glory? <laughs> Not Merritt, it's Custer that gets the glory, especially at Winchester. And, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but it can happen all the time. It just, uh, at Cedar Creek, Custer rips into the Confederates, captures untold numbers of battle flags and stuff like that. Whereas Merritt is kind of dilly dallying a little bit to the point where even the infantry gets ahead of him. And, you know, he ends up writing a letter to the papers in which he just about called Custer a liar. He begged Custer to give him some of the credit for the capture of the guns and the flags and stuff like that. And Custer told him, hey, I'm not giving you anything. And if you persist in trying to get some of my glory, I'm going to take you out back to this tent and I'm going to beat the heck out of you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, then he goes to Washington because it's an election year. Lincoln needs good news. He goes to Washington and... Secretary of War Stanton tells him, I'm making you a major general. Ulysses says, Grant hears about it in the newspapers and freaks out because the army had always tried to maintain a seniority system that would keep merit above Custer. Yes, sir. So Sheridan got a little upset and for a few days there, he didn't grant merit his commission as a Major General, and Custer had seniority for just a few days. But then they went back, predated the, the papers, and Merritt is once again on top. So you mentioned Sheridan, you mentioned Cedar Creek. Sheridan, again, pugnacious reputation, very aggressive guy. Do you think that his, for lack of a better term, sponsorship of Custer comes from seeing a kindred spirit he likes seeing a general officer at the front. He likes seeing an aggressive guy. And Merritt just wasn't his type of cavalryman. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that Merritt was just a, as much of a frontline leader as Custer. I have, you know, at least a dozen accounts of Merritt being up on the front line, on the skirmish line, up there with his guys. So that's not true. And on top of that, while... He considered Custer, you know, a brave boy is what he called. And he points out to all the actions that he had fought in. When wintertime came, he invites Merritt to go to Washington with him. And they spend the winter together carousing and drinking and stuff like that. And it was Sheridan who kept 
merit over Custer and depended on him totally. So it would be incorrect to say that Sheridan favored Custer over merit. No, the opposite is true. Wow. He favored merit over Custer. And again, that galled Custer to no end because he felt that he was a much better soldier with more successes, more spectacular successes to his name than Merritt, who was kind of like, I'd say a stoic, thorough professional. He just didn't have the color. It's, it's like, you know, these people are sitting at home reading all these black headlines, reading the lists of the dead and the wounded and stuff like that. And Custer gave the, the news that splash of color that you know people needed in order to be, be a little bit heartened about the progress of the war. So Merritt was definitely Sheridan's favorite. Track and sir, that's that's fascinating to hear. Now transitioning a little bit, the Boy Generals, the book we're talking about now, that takes us from their you know pre-military days through their time at the military academy. They were there at different times, Merritt's pre-war career. And then early days of the Civil War, and it's going to take us up to about 1863, correct? It's going to take us to the third day of Battle of Gettysburg. Yes. Sir. Then Volume Two picks up the pursuit of Lee's retreating army, and it goes on until the opening days of the Shenandoah Valley Campaign. Then Volume Three picks up the big majority of the Shenandoah Valley Campaign and the things that went wrong there between the two of them, goes into uh, uh, all the way through to Appomattox and a little bit beyond when Sheridan mounted an expedition that was supposed to go to Texas and throw the French out of Mexico. Yes, sir. So what, what is the, if you, if you can share this with us, what is your timeline for volumes two and three? I'm hoping to see volume two come out towards the end of uh, 2022 with uh the third volume coming out about a year later that's fantastic yeah. that's very exciting and your and your publisher sir is whom uh my publisher is savas Beatty, the most renowned civil war publisher in the united states the guy is like a total workaholic he recently uh did a project in which he published the three uh three volumes of the official records of of um Gettysburg. He did a big tribute issue for uh, uh, the late great Ed Bars on the Richmond campaign, Petersburg campaign, and you know he he's very active in the emerging Civil War, which is not exactly a detailed study of everything, but every book is kind of like a starter set. So if you wanted to, for instance, say study the Battle of Chancellorsville you would get the emerging civil war and that would give you the ability to move into more detail if that's the direction you wanted to head in. So the guy is super knowledgeable. He's written his own books on, on several civil war subjects. He's, he, how can I say this? If he makes you a promise, he's going to keep it. Yes, sir. Uh, can't say a better thing about a person than that. But uh, Emerging Civil War series, that is a fantastic series. I was honored to have uh, Dr. Murkowski on the, the podcast a little while ago, sharing a little bit about that. So just a, a great series. And, and as you said, Savas Beatty, what a great publishing house. I'm, I'm very excited that you work with them. And I'm super excited to hear that we're just about a year away from volume two. Uh, can't wait to see what's going to happen next. So since you're working, that's a pretty aggressive schedule. You've got, you just, this one has just come out fairly recently. You're going to look to get volume two out in one year and volume three out within two years. What, what is your, your writing process like? If you don't mind sharing that with us a little bit. Well, to be honest with you, I've got all three volumes written. Um, it might be a little bit outdated on volumes two and three. So basically all I need to do for volume two is to tweak it a little bit. You know, there's been a little bit of new information that's come out and stuff like that. And I kind of looked to add stuff to it. And then volume three is the same thing. It's already written, you know, it's, it's a, all three volumes are a little bit lengthy. He's always on my case about <laughs> cut back on it a little bit, Al. Uh, so I've done that, but 
um, like I say, the, the whole thing was written. I've been, I wrote my first book on Custer in 2004 and I self-published. It was called Cross Sabres, George Custer and the Shenandoah Valley Campaign of 64, 65. And as I said, Ted makes you a promise, he follows through. Un my unfortunate experience with this first company, which shall remain nameless, was the total opposite. They promised me the world, and then they didn't do squat for me. And, you know, I never sold enough, but I learned from it. And on top of that, as a result of it, I was able to meet uh, a person who became my mentor and very good friend, which is Eric J. Wittenberg, one of the biggest authorities on Union Cavalry in the United States. Uh, so, you know, that was the great saving grace. I can truthfully say that without Eric's help and contributions to my manuscript, and he's read all three, this thing would never have been written. His wealth of knowledge, his ability to share it with me, um, you know, it was just one of those, you know, you call it destiny. He and I were destined to meet, and we met because of this disaster of a book called uh, George Cross Sabers. So, you know, uh, that was really you know, the saving grace of the whole part of the whole project. But I've been writing, you know, when he critiqued my book, I just took that as a challenge to better the next one. And I had it already already had established a base that I could work off of. So I was able to, you know, keep working. And he was the one that introduced me to Ted Savas, and he was the one that uh, got me, you know, the publishing contract with Ted. That's outstanding. And, and I'm really glad you guys met up because it's it's resulted in a, a fantastic book, and we're looking forward to the next volumes. I got one final question for you, sir, and uh, it goes back to your writing process and your research. Uh, since you're based out of Florida now, and you, as you said, you can't get to Little Bighorn, but you can get to some Civil War battlefields. Do you make sure you get on the ground as, and study actions when you're going to write about them? Have you had the opportunity to go to all the different locations where these men fought? I'm not going to tell you that I've been to all of them because a lot of them have been uh, the victims of population. Yes, sir. You know, you know you, Winchester is stretched its town limits and the places where the Battle of Third Winchester took place, well, there's very little left. But the one thing that Eric has stressed to me over and over again is you have to walk the battlefield in order to be able to understand it. Now, I have been a member of a group called uh, the Chambersburg uh, Chamber of Commerce's Civil War Seminar Series for quite some time now. And I've been to dozens of battlefields stretching from Gettysburg down to Richmond and Petersburg and all the way to Appomattox with these guys over all the years that I've been associated with them. So that, yes, I, I've walked as many battlefields as I could in preparation for writing these books. Oh, that's fantastic. And it, it, it certainly comes through as a, as a former soldier. When I read it, you can, you can tell when someone understands the terrain about which they're writing. So it's fantastic. So everybody, this has been Ben Powers uh, from the Commander's Voice today, talking a little Civil War history with my new friend, Al. Again, his book is uh, The Boy Generals from Savas Beatty Publishing, uh, one of the best Civil War books I've read. I'm a huge fan. Uh, Al, thanks for coming on the show today. Well, thank you much, Ben. It was a great pleasure talking to you. And uh, hopefully when the next one comes out, we'll talk again. Outstanding, sir. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Same to you. Thank you.